Hello beer geeks, I'm super excited to say that I am at the Willy Wonka factory of homebrewing, which is the amazing Malt Miller, who have been so helpful with my craft beer journey, particularly over the last, uh, last 12 months with the amount of homebrewing that we've been doing during lockdown. And I'm also with one of our collaborators with whom we made the monstrosity that was our pumpkin <laughs> spice latte. Uh, this is Andy from Elusive, thanks for coming on. I really like that beer. So we are down at Malt Miller, I've been filming with Andy making some homebrewing videos for camera, which you can watch, there will be a link below for that but with the amazing minds behind the camera and the amazing mind in front of it i thought it'd be a great opportunity to answer some of the questions that we get in the comments of every homebrew video we do so this is our top five tip series and this time we're talking fermentation and of course dry hopping So one of the things I learned really quickly when I started homebrewing seriously was that probably the most important part of the, of the whole brewing is the fermentation. Like you can do all the great work that you want to in the mash and the boil, but if the temperature's wrong, the yeast choice was wrong, something goes wrong with that yeast and it's not happy, you can ruin the entire beer. Um, and I think that a lot of people are quite naive when they get into homebrewing and don't think about the fermentation thing. I've done the brew day, smashed it. So much happens afterwards. Um, we get lots of questions about how to make sure there's a, there's a good ferment. Um, one of the ones that I've learned really helps is, is using nutrients, uh, which I'd never really considered before. What, what are these nutrients and, and what are they doing? Yeah, so they're nutrients that are helping create the ideal uh, conditions for the yeast to grow and ferment. So um, yeah, it's different um, compounds and um, minerals. So it's just sort of foods for the yeast and you can just buy that from your home. Yeah, store things like or... zinc and, and so on that, that help the yeast get going and get, get started. Right. And when it comes to big beers, that's really important, but also so is pitching the right amount of yeast. That is the one thing, like pitching the right amount of viable yeast is the one thing. Like those, that first day or two of, of fermentation is the most important. Get off to a good start and you, you're laughing. Right, so a sluggish start could, could present issues further down the line. Definitely, really yeah, and like, sl like a sluggish start, chlorophenol is the main one you get where everything smells of chlorine, weirdly. Uh, yeah, that's a, you, normally down to a sluggish start. Right, and how, how would you know that you're pitching the right amount? Like, if you're a home brewer, I guess we're talking how many packs. So for, you know, session four, five, six percent, you might get away with, you know, the, the standard size of, of yeast pack. But beyond that, you need to start Yeah, like there's a great online thing, Mr. Multi's Yeast Calculator. Have a look at that. So that you feed in your original gravity of your work and the parameters from your yeast, and it tells you how much yeast to pitch, how many packets if it's dried, right. or the volume if it's liquid. Yeah. You might want to look at, for a big high gravity work, looking at a starter. So take your smack pack or your sachet, create a little starter and grow that before you pitch it into your work. And that just means it's going to kick off and, and be healthy almost from the start. Exactly. One of the most difficult things I think for homebrewers is finding a place to ferment and a temperature to ferment that's right for that yeast. So what, what tips have you got for people that maybe don't have full fermentation control or maybe can't keep it in a dark place? How do they make sure that they get the best from their beer? What I used to do, I, when I started homebrewing, didn't have any temperature control. I used to just ferment with the seasons. So in the summer brew saisons where you don't mind if it's warm, the yeast loves it. Uh, in the autumn spring brewing ales that need a kind of a room temperature, 20 degree vibe, sit it in the corner in your dining room or wherever. And uh, yeah, use the conditions of the environment to support the yeast. Right, and you can get products as well that will help it stay slightly at the temperature that you need it to be. Like you can get jackets, or you could use yeah, you can get plates that you sit on, uh, or if it's in the winter, you can wrap it in a towel and try and keep it warm. Mm -hmm. uh, use your thermometer to work out where in the house is right. Um, yeah, for the I see a lot of people put their fermenters next to radiators, and to me that seems mad because while it might be the right temperature while the radiator's on, what you're creating is a yeah, a lot of shift. variance, which a lot of yeast don't like. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So it's finding the most consistent spot, and if if you can't find a dark place, covering it, particularly if it's a hoppy beer, because light strike can could take minutes. It can if you if you're using glass demijohns in particular, yeah, get those wrapped and covered and keep the light out. Right. Something you really wanted to talk about in this video was sanitation tips. So we've all had infected batches and sometimes struggle to find said infection as to what's causing it. What are some tips? You know, is it taking everything apart each time? to? Clean? Yeah, like definitely. Like if, we, if we've got an effort in front of us here, um, you want to unscrew that tap and give that a good clean out. You, you cannot over sanitize, like put all your time and effort into when you start home brewing, get your sanitation regime down, get it sorted. Yeah, so as soon as you're coming off the boil, everything from that point, you want to know that it's come apart, it's been cleaned. Yep. Um, and it's been put back together with clean hands. Yeah, get it nice and clean. I mean, heat and contact time are, are your friends for cleaning. So get some boiling water, for example, run that through everything, soak everything nice and hot, uh, and then sanitize with a off-the-shelf product like Starsan or similar, get everything nice and sanitized ready for your work. And you can do all that during the boil. 
Right, now I feel like we're going to slightly disagree on something, which is about dry hop timings. OK, so what, what do you think about the biotransformation addition? So what at the peak Krausen that's being used in these New England beers, do you see much of that effect of adding those hops in? Yes, we do, particularly in maintaining haze. We've played around with, um, in fact, dry hopping on transfer. So hops go into the FE before the work through to dry hopping at high Krausen. And uh, we played around and yeah, get the, getting hops in nice and early definitely contributes to a more stable haze. And you, you haven't found any grassy aromas from being sat on those hops? For no, we don't, we're not doing uh, too much of the addition at that point. Most of the addition goes in late and a nice short contact time, but it's just a, an addition, maybe around 10, 20% of the dry hop goes in as part of that biotransformation right. addition. So if you're hopping early, you hop light just to make sure you get a bit of biotransformation, but the bulk of it is much shorter contact time, like what? I do 48 yeah, hours. Yeah, no, that... three, three days, four days max, I'd say. Right, okay. And at what temperature are you doing those op additions? So we don't crop and reuse our yeast at Elusive, so we're doing them at ambient. So fermentation finishes around 19, 20 degrees, dry hops in at that point, 24, 36 hour rest, check gravity, start to chill. Okay, because there's this risk of a thing called hop creep where uh, the yeast might break down some of the hops and start and produce something that's fermentable again and you yeah. can kick off fermentation. So, you, well, you just give it time to. We give it time. So, we, we, as I said, we're not cropping our yeast, so we'll do that at ambient where the yeast is still happy and active. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's going to creep, let it creep, let it rest, and then crash it afterwards. Yeah. Okay, so in our New England video that we did with Verdant, uh, instead of doing that, we dropped it down below 15 degrees, so there was no fermentation, and then you add the hops and cold crash and, and leave it for about 45, 48 hours. So both of those ones, both of those methods will end up with hopefully no diacetyl or, or anything like that. But if you can't cold crash, then it's about giving it the time to make sure that that's not going to happen. Yeah, let that creep happen and let the diet clean up and then move on. So like I said, fermentation is definitely the most important part of the homebrew process, I think, or rather it's the point where most homebrews go wrong. If, you, if you're having issues with your homebrew, it's quite likely it's not happened on the brew day, it's happened since. So I hope that really helps. If you've got any questions, please, please do drop them in the comments. And if I don't know the answer, hopefully Andy will, and he'll get an email from me. We've got loads of amazing homebrew content all over the channel. There's playlists coming up now. There's specific videos coming up now. And of course, our video with Andy Parker, where we, uh, we threw all the rules out of the window and made a pumpkin spice latte. Cheers.